Yo Genkinanam, Tlu Bakwam, Tlu Mamasa, Hemazagami Hanalas, Bezalah Namkis, Tlu Mamtagila. My name is, uh, well, hello everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Hanalas, or you can call me Dakota. I come from the Mamtagila and the Namkis tribes, the Pukwakiwak Nation. Um, I'm uh, talking to you from Alert Bay, Elise, uh, Namkis territory. Um, so doing a uh, sort of uh, uh, online uh, land acknowledgement. Um, everybody here is, is uh, pretty much coming from uh, different territories. Um, uh, we have uh, Maya, who's uh, uh, over in uh, Lekwungen territories and down south in Victoria. Uh, Julius and Sarah Ross in uh, Silotus uh, territories over in uh, Vancouver area. Um, and today we're going to be drawing the uh, hummingbird, and uh, we have some awesome panelists uh, here talking about uh, an amazing uh, hummingbird nest finding project. Uh, so with um, Sarah Ross and, and Donna Clark, and with that, I'll uh, I'll leave you to uh, explain what what you do there, uh, Sarah. Sure. Thank you, Dakota. Hi, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here with you. Um, really briefly, the Community Nest Finding Network, uh, we, we established last spring and we were in Burn what's called Burnaby. And we were there because there was a big area of forest that was supposed to be cut by the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion. And we had some people living in trees at that time. They lived in trees for 14 months. But um, which is amazing. And they stopped the cutting of the trees. Um, but we were there because the tree sitters noticed that hummingbirds were around and we realized that nests were protected under federal law. So the Community Nest Finding Network mobilized a bunch of keen nature folks and bird lovers. And we went out early mornings and found nests um, that we used to stop uh, pipeline development. So that we really worked as allies with the hummingbirds and we'll, we'll share more of our story um, throughout the session, but that's the community nest finding network. Yeah. And actually I have a little quick screen share that I'll just share of our, uh, of our banner. And this was, this banner was from Tanya Willard, who's a Kwatmuk uh, First Nations artist. Yeah. Stop work. Thanks, Donna. Yeah, just maybe make a little mention. Uh, Tanya Willard, Sequetmec. Of course, the Trans Mountain Pipeline is going through her territory too. And when she heard about the work we were doing, she offered to do this artwork for us. So there she was. Um, I'd uh, like to take a moment, I uh, almost forgot, uh, to do a little shout out to uh, Miss Suzanne's uh, grade two class at Puntledge Elementary School, uh, Mr. Graham's uh, grade three, four class at the Balsam School, and also Miss B's Hummingbird class at Salt Spring Elementary, uh, grade two class, <laughs> that uh, wants to learn how to draw that bird that inspires them to move around quickly and smell the flowers. So, hey, um. Excellent. Um, did we want to move right into the drawing then? Sounds good. Okay, great. Uh, then, um, so what we're going to do here is uh, everybody's seen in, in, in previous ones is that I'm going to uh, start drawing, but I'm going to start sharing my screen actually first. And while we do this, uh, we're going to have a lot of fun discussing really fascinating things about how these beautiful birds live, their biology, and what's being done to help protect them. Um, they are our neighbors, and let's think of them as neighbors and respect them that way, uh, rather than as some people think of they're just in the way of industry or something like that. So, I mean, this is where I'm really happy to see what Sarah and Donna uh, and others uh, in their group have done uh, to 
you know, bring attention to these birds' presence in areas that are threatened by, uh, say, activity from uh, this uh, development of industry. We need to be respectful of them and uh, realize that they're there and that they have every right uh, to be there as much as we do. So we're um, going to be drawing this bird here. Today, the Rufus hummingbird, which is one of four species of hummingbird that live in BC. In, depending on where you live in BC, you may see one or the other of them. Um, and uh, the Rufus hummingbird is the only uh, native uh, indigenous species that is present uh, where many of us live here on the West Coast that are uh, piping into you via the network. Um, there is another species as well that has moved into the area over the last few decades um, that uh, Sarah and Donna will be able to talk to you more about as well. And that I happen to uh, be lucky also to have a little female spe uh, of the species that uh, that lives outside of my balcony and frequently comes to our feeder and flowers and such lavender flowers in the summer and so on. But we're going to be covering the the Rufus hummingbird. It is a beautiful species. So here I've done a little quick sketch of one with in color to show you basically what this looks like. Um, the thing to keep in mind is that that little uh, feathers on the throat called the gorget. Uh, it, it's iridescent, which means that when you turn it uh, in the light, it'll change color just like um, like, like metallic sort of uh, sheen to it. It's beautiful. Whenever you see these hummingbirds in the wild, they're spectacular, especially the, the males have the brightest color and the most uh, iridescent uh, gorget, but females also have some of that. So let's, um, I'll show you what we're going to do. And, and while we're going through this, I'm going to invite any of the panelists to share information uh, whenever it seems relevant, because we're going to be just kind of drawing several different um, examples of hummingbirds here. I'm going to try something a little different from before. I'm going to go a little bit uh, faster, a little bit less of the kind of waiting around with the lines. I'll keep drawing as we uh, discuss things. And you can just follow along. Uh, and I'll, I'll try to keep it at a nice, smooth pace so that you can follow along from home or from class. And, um, a, a, but I won't necessarily explain every single line. Uh, so we're gonna go at it that way. This is what we're planning to draw today. And I'm going to start setting up the drawing. So like before, we have this set up for an eight and a half by 11 inch page. So regular letter size sheet uh, and just a regular pencil will work for you. And then you can always color these in afterwards as well. And maybe even send them off in letters to to uh, government officials to you know, tell them how much you love hummingbirds and how, you, how much you want them to help you to protect them and their forest environments. So here we go. I'm going to um, take down the preview. If I'm looking down some of the time, uh, <laughs> I apologize because I've got my, uh, this is my stylus and I have a um, drawing tablet and it's down below me and my camera is up there. So I'm gonna have to go back and forth between the camera and the, the drawing tablet here. So what we're going to do here is, whoops, oh, that's the sample I just took down. We're going to start drawing um, the one that's flying, that's similar to the one that you saw in the advertisement for this, uh, for this fun webinar. And then we're going to go and talk about various parts of the life uh, cycle of this uh, beautiful animal as well. So the first thing we're going to do is imagine this bird, that this is a tiny bird. And keep in mind, birds are descended directly from dinosaurs. They are dinosaurs, um, very literally. So can you imagine the size of a, of a Tyrannosaurus rex, for example? Everybody knows they're huge, right? They would have stood as, as tall as, as, as like one and a half of your floors in, in, in your house, for example. And this, hummingbirds are the tiniest known dinosaurs. So we have living today the tiniest dinosaurs that, as far as we know, ever lived. And these can fly and hover like bees. I mean, that is really wild. Uh, talk about an amazing uh, way to, to evolve into a very interesting form. Uh, so this little guy, the Rufus hummingbird, has a wingspan of approximately 11 centimeters. So it would easily fit in your hand. They're tiny. We're going to start by drawing the underside of the, the body. So you know, imagine your page set up into sort of quarters. You're going to move towards sort of the top upper left part but not too far away from the middle. So I'm going to try to keep in mind where I'm drawing on the page and try to match it so that we have enough space for all of it. I'm going to draw first the um, part of the body of the bird. We're going to start like 
right around here. And it's a, it's a shorter line like this, kind of curvy line. Just a, a little bit of a curvy. It's mostly straight, but with a bit of a curve on it. Okay, so that's the underside of the of the throat and the belly. Uh, and then we're going to finish the head above it like this. So just to give you an idea of what part of the bird we're doing, this is on the right there where I just finished. That's where the beak is going to go. Okay, so that gives us an idea for the overall sort of uh, size of the bird here, partly. It doesn't look much like the bird yet, but, but it, it's going to as we add more details. Uh, so these are, and this here is going to be the, uh, the rump or the back part of the, of the animal's back. Like this. Again, doesn't look much like the bird yet. These wonderful little creatures, unlike most other birds, can hover in place. There are some birds that can hover in different ways. Uh, kites, which are a type of uh, a relative of, of falcons, uh, can hover uh, pretty well when they, they place themselves in such a way that, that they... Um, kites and then harriers, which are our type of hawk, can actually hover really well uh, when, when they move their wings in certain ways and, and align themselves with the wind. And they can hover and, 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 and look down and catch prey that way. But, but they move their wings relatively slowly. Flycatchers and other group of birds can also hover, sort of, um, as they're looking for insects on, on the wing. But hummingbirds, unlike these guys, can move their wings incredibly fast and, and use them to hover in the same way that bees do. And uh, Sarah or Donna, can you tell us anything about the, the way that their wings move? Because that's fascinating to me. And I'm going to keep drawing while you do this. I, I have a story that I think, I think um, everybody will like to hear uh, if they haven't already heard it. It's a Quechua indigenous story from South America that has made its way up the coast. And um, it's the story of the hummingbird that really inspired us um, when we found, um, when, when the hummingbird did stop the pipeline in so-called Burnaby. And it was a story that was made accessible to us by Michael Nicole Yan Gulanas, who's a Haida manga artist. And um, I don't know if, if your audience has heard of the flight of the hummingbird that was illustrated by that, um, that Haida artist, but it's an amazing uh, story of how, a you, Julius, you've described how tiny that hummingbird is. And the story is about how this little tiny hummingbird uh, mother, during a forest fire, all the there was a forest fire, and all the animals and birds were freaking out, of course, because their homes were in danger. And this little tiny hummingbird was filling her beak up with water and flying to the fire and letting the water out on top of the fire. And the other animals were laughing at her and they were kind of frustrated because they said, you're not gonna make any difference at all with, to that fire, putting, trying to put it out with a little bit of water in your beak. And she said, I'm doing the best I can and I'm not gonna give up. So it's, it was just a really inspiring story about how just making how we can, no matter how small we are or how small we think our contribution is, just trying to do our best to support our community and to help the forest can make a difference. I want to tell you that story. That's <laughs> a story that's come up the coast. I like that a lot. I think um, I think it's something that so much more of us um, have to remember actively these days, especially because there's so much bad news that we see, uh, not just in terms of the way that you know humans are are suffering on Earth, but how the natural world, world is suffering because of our activities. And many people do become very discouraged uh, by this, and they feel like, oh, might as well give up. What could I do that would make a difference? But this is a good example of something that we need to remind ourselves and, and our friends is that, yes, what we do actually can make a difference. And why don't we just do the decent thing? 
regardless of what anybody else does, let's just do what's right. And if everybody thought that way, we would all be acting. So just, just do what, what, what helps. Do what would, would make a difference if you knew you were making a difference, right? Because if we do that and everybody thinks that way, then we absolutely will make a difference. That's, I think, the secret. But I love that story. Hey, Julius, I can add something about how they, how they hover. Oh, yes. Mm-hmm. Um, that um, I think it's they, they move their wings in a figure eight um, pattern. Um, but one of the things that I was really lucky to be able to see was one thing, the hummingbirds that we were paying attention to were the Anna's hummingbirds. Oh, yes. And they are the one you were mentioning that is fairly new to our region. Their range has been expanding over the last, I don't know, 50 years. Mm-hmm. So we were paying attention to the Anna's hummingbirds because they're here all year. They don't actually migrate and they start nesting as early as December. So if you're looking for a bird to stop a pipeline nesting in the winter, you can watch the Annas. That's a great and point. so I got to see the mama Anna, Anna's hummingbird before she builds her nest, she investigates various locations. And I watched her hovering with her. I couldn't see what she was doing with her wings, but knowing that she's doing this figure eight hovering. And then she turned on top of the same branch in a 360 degrees. She looked all the way around. Wow. And I had done my research um, using the internet mostly. And I had learned that that's a thing that the mother does before she builds a nest. She basically investigates the site by turning in a 360 degree um, place. And I looked at it. I took a GPS coordinate and five days later, there was a nest there. Wow. Yeah. It was That's really cool. cool to see. It's, it's amazing. Not many birds could pull that off. Just kind of hover there and just kind of. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a little turret. That's and wonderful. then there was a, ne- a nest there. And I was like, okay, well, it looks like they can't build the pipeline here. Yep, 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 yep. She did her job. I knew where to look. <laughs> that's really cool. amazing. Mm-hmm. And it's the, that's, that's the thing. The way they move their wings is very much like a, a bee, actually. And this is what's really unusual among birds. You don't see other birds doing this. But if you look at them closely, if you look at a slow motion video, you'll see that their wings, and I've just drawn the wings of, of this animal here, you'll see that the wings kind of, um, one wing will kind of do this kind of a wavy as as uh sarah was saying a figure eight the tip of the wing describes kind of a figure eight um and it it allows the bird to push air down in both beats of the wing the the upstroke which is when they raise their wings and the downstroke which is when they um they uh, flap them downward but this flapping is kind of going back and forth instead of just upward and downward and they change the angle of their wing so that each time the wing is pushing air down and it allows them to be constantly pushing air away from them and staying aloft. That's how they are able to hover so amazingly smoothly. So, and now one little bit here that we're going to add to this bird uh, next is not part of the hovering, but is part of the, the perching, their feet. They have incredibly tiny feet. Uh, When they're flying, they retract these feet, kind of like an airplane, into their feathers. And all you see, uh, like, uh, not the legs, but you just see the tips of the feet. And so we're going to draw this little bit of feet here. You could almost just draw almost like a dot. Dot. Basically, they're curled up little toes. Adorable toes. They're so small. And there's like a little, it's almost like there's a little hook there from one of the claws. But you can't really see much except this tiny little dots in the bottom of their body retracted. Uh, Super amazing. And they don't need big legs, right? Because they're so light that that they don't need thick legs to support their weight even when they're sitting. Uh, this is true for all small animals, that they don't need a lot of strength. Relative to their body size, their legs are strong, even at that tiny size. So I'm going to add now the, the back end, sort of just just before the tail feathers, there's the, the, the back end of the, of the body of the hummingbird and we're going to see a bunch of small little overlapping feathers here so a lot of the hummingbirds feathers are smooth uh on their body but there are some places where you can see individual feathers sort of overlapping more obviously partly because of their colors so here at the back of the hummingbird you'll see kind of like imagine the edge of a scallop 
um, those kinds of clam relatives. Uh, this is almost like scales on a fish, you can see. It sort of looks a little bit like that. You have a bunch of feathers that just kind of overlap like this, and just a bunch of little U shapes, okay? like that. And that is not the actual tail feathers, the, 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 the flying tail feathers, the ones that help it like a rudder. Those are just the little, little sort of covert type of tail feathers, the parts that, that kind of just cover the others. Okay? But now I'm going to show you, we're going to draw the tail feathers. And this is kind of important for, for distinguishing the rufous hummingbird. Because here in BC, we don't have a lot of hummingbirds that look like it. There are only four types, uh, the rufous hummingbird, the calliope hummingbird, which is more of a mountain species, the black-chinned hummingbird, which is also a little bit east of the coast, more interior, and the Anna's hummingbird, as Sarah was describing, which has moved up the coast from California and is now actually living as far north as Alaska. Uh, and none of these others look like the rufous hummingbird very much, especially the adult males. But there are other birds in other parts of North America, and, and some of you may be tuning in from these places as well, for all I know, uh, that have the Allen's hummingbird present, which does look a lot like the Rufus hummingbird. And you have to look at the tail feathers especially to be able to, to tell them apart. And so what we're going to do is draw these tail feathers, and I'll show you what's special about this one. So if you happen to see either an Allen's or a Rufus hummingbird, you can tell them apart if you're lucky enough to see them spread their tail feathers, which again is not easy to see because mostly they spread their tail feathers a lot like this when you have two of the males um, combating each other. In other words, they do these big displays uh, for territory because hummingbirds like to hold down territories. And territories consist of groups of plants that flower because hummingbirds, unlike most other birds, drink nectar from flowers, as you may know. And they need this high quality um, uh, carbohydrate or, or calorie rich foods like nectar, like sugar water, basically, to be able to keep their energy for flying and, and expending as much energy as they do when they hover. So they need to drink nectar. And for that, they need to have a nice stable, sort of almost like a crop, <laughs> a garden of flowers that they defend from other birds, from other hummingbirds, especially. And so the males will sometimes make big displays to each other to say, hey, this is my place, or displays to females. Like, look at me, I'm, I'm really a nice uh, potential uh, you know, father to your kids. And so they'll display and they'll show their tail feathers. And when they do, this is kind of what it looks like. Uh, they'll briefly kind of flash them out like this. And so we're gonna start on one side and draw, and there's a certain number of tail feathers. I'll start at the top here with this, this first tail feather. There will be one, two, three, four, five tail feathers on each side of the hummingbird. So that's one. Second one is a wee bit longer. They're relatively pointy, but they're kind of rounded. Now notice when I'm drawing these, the top or front end of the feathers overlaps the, the back end of the feather that's before it. And this is very important for flight. Now, here's the key. I'm going to explain that a little bit more, but here's the key. This feather, um, this uh, second feather from the bottom, because I'll add one more here. This is the last one on this side. See how they change in shape? You see I, um, oh, wanna sorry, I, yeah, I want to reflect a little bit on uh, some of the things that we were talking about. Um, I, I liked how you mentioned their neighbors. Because uh, that's, you know, that's how we think about uh, the animal kingdom uh, and, and, our, and our culture and the Kokokiwa culture, right? They are our neighbors and, and relatives. And um, and seeing them, like, like when we, we hunt, uh, for instance, um, it's, uh, it's a belief that, um, that that animal like, gave its life for us, sacrificed its life for us. So we could, we could uh, have life. Right, and it's it's kind of like in our culture we talk a lot about balance and not taking too much from from the forest or from the sea, and um, you know I I, I kind of re reflect on it as a reciprocal relationship or a symbiotic relationship as like yeah I'm hunting um, or I'm fishing but 
I also have a responsibility to these animals to, to help take care of them, right? And as as uh, you're talking about this uh, this hummingbird going over to uh, putting its nests in the in the way of the pipeline, you know, it feels um, I, kind of uh, similar in that like this bird, this neighbor is helping us, its neighbor, right? And it's it's again, it's our responsibility to help them out too, right? We all have to live on this planet together with our neighbors, whether they are animals from the animal kingdom or they're um, mammothla settlers or or people who are displaced uh, from uh, other other parts of the world. Um, we, you know, we, we all have a responsibility together to uh, to uphold um, this this reciprocal relationship that that should be and find some some semblance of, of balance right so much so yeah, yeah it's it's uh, interesting to um to, <laughs> to see uh, uh bird watchers <laughs> uh find a way to uh use that as a tool to help uh you know uh, this environmentalist uh, a movement um, absolutely mm -hmm. actually um on that note um uh I, I, I'd be curious to see what, and, and I, I, I really like that, uh, that outlook. Like we need to have everybody share that outlook because we, we are all in this together and we do have a chance to help each other, uh, both of our own species and other species. I, I think that we, it's our responsibility. Um, I, I, I totally agree with that. And I just want everybody to be able to think that way as well. And that's what we should be pushing for. Um, two things as well. I just want to point out real quick that that feather I, I, I drew a line to here is the one that you can tell apart this uh the, the roof is from the allens especially there's this funny little shape of that notch at the end of the feather and then each of these feathers has this, this central shaft or rachis uh, that i'll add to them and that the feathers overlap in a very specific way um that's important for their flight but i also would like to ask now um sarah or donna to say more about how they were able to be in, involved in, in as, as Dakota was saying, how their uh, work um, helped to uh, pause or, you know, to, to, to kind of get in the way of some of the highly exploitative and destructive activities that, that we've been seeing, if you have a chance. Can, Donna, do you want to, do you want to go, Donna? For me? Sure. I mean, I have something to say too, but go ahead. Okay. Maybe we can both say something. I'll, I'll start and you finish. Sure. Okay. Um, well, it's, it's odd because us humans were struggling to stop the pipeline because we felt the pipeline, you know, the pipeline route goes from Edmonton to Farrar Inlet and it was cutting they were cutting down a whole ribbon of trees they were clear cutting trees endangering the water and so us humans are really struggling to to stop this pipeline to stop the destruction of the trees and the birds and the salmon and all life really and and um, it was so ironic that this little Anna's, this little mother, this little mother hummingbird, this little Anna's hummingbird was able to stop the pipeline where, where we couldn't. And as Sarah mentioned before, it was because there's this old law from, well, not that old, but from the 1920s called the Migratory Bird um, Protection Act or Convention Act, can't read, Convention Act, and you're not allowed to chop, to, you're not allowed to destroy a nest um, of a migratory bird during nesting season. And that was the, so this little mother hummingbird allowed us humans to leverage that law to stop the pipeline. And there's a bit more detail there, but I think I've spoken enough, and I'm going to pass it over to my my friend and colleague Sarah to add something to the story. Thanks, Donna. Um, yeah, what comes to mind for me is um, uh, it was the way that we approached our work, and 
Um, yeah, Dakota, you said, you know, it's funny that bird watchers could do this. And I don't think I would describe us as bird watchers exactly. Um, we, most of the people who worked with the Community Nest Finding Network were actually um, nature educators. And we have learned um, and practiced this kind of um, deeply respectful way of walking upon the earth where the first thing we pay attention to is like, are we disturbing anything or anyone? And so when we set out on our early morning investigations looking for, looking for nests, it was with this attitude that we were entering someone else's home, someone else's territory, um, the, of all the, all the ones that fly and those on the ground and this, the trees. And um, so, and we would use all our senses. So mostly hearing, I would say, we were, we were attuned to the sound of the female hummingbirds who make small noises when they're feeding, especially when they're coming to their nest. That was something we learned from doing the work. But um, whenever we heard um, a bird that was sounding any kind of an alarm call or a call that would indicate um, distress of any kind, it would mean, you know, maybe we had gone too close to a nesting area of another bird or into the territory of another bird. Mostly we just sat down and we sat for long periods of time, like just listening, paying attention. And quite frankly, like with an open heart, I would wear um, a, a bright red hair elastic <laughs> because I, you know, and I would say, as I approached, I would say, I'm here to help you. We're here to protect you. And ordinarily I wouldn't ask you hummingbirds, but please show us your nest. We're here to protect you if you can show us. So we went in with such an attitude of, um, of respect and um, yeah, it was, it was beautiful. And we, we shared that with all the volunteers that worked with us. Um, it was really the most the most important thing we did. That's uh, that's amazing. Um, thank you for that reflection. You know, and yeah, like I think a lot of people don't know how to enter these spaces with respect and and knowing you're in another community, right? You know, just like cougar and bear. Uh, oh, I don't know about Vancouver, but you know, over on Vancouver Island. Here, they have cougar and bear. They walk into the streets all the time. Same with deer, and um, you know, it's because we've taken up so much of their home and their communities. And so, when I walk into the forest, you know, that's one of the things I do is I announce myself and my intentions, like you were talking about when you're looking for the, the hummingbird. You know, I let the trees, I let the bear and cougar know that I'm not, I don't have any ill intentions. I'm there to do good work, and it's the same when we're. Um, foraging for our medicines or even just picking berries you know you have to do that with uh respect and um and uh, i heard uh, i remember uh donna mentioned something about uh, uh, laws or and uh that's something i want to touch on is like uh for for us you know we have laws too in our indigenous indigenous nations but you know they come from our, our heart you know they're they're not so much laws as responsibilities right we have a responsibility to our direct environment, our Awinakola, the land, the sea, the skies, the mountains. And um, you know, that's why, you know, a lot of us are so adamant and so many uh, indigenous nations are, are standing up to uh, these corporations and, and governments that are trying to push these pipelines through. And it's, um, you know, it's, it's a sad thing to see when, you know, no free prior informed consent has been has, has been established um, even after UNDRIP, right? And, and people are still being persecuted on their own lands. Um, but we're able to, but it's, but it's an animal's life that's able to, to stop, start halting these, these pipelines, um, seeing a clear violation of like human rights. And, you know, people talk about indigenous rights, but when we stand up for uh, indigenous peoples and their nations and their cultures were protecting their direct climate and environment. Collectively, all the indigenous nations all over the world were protecting the world's climate, right? And everybody lives on this planet. You know? I don't want to displace people with, you know, climate refugees, more displacement due to colonization, resource extraction, um, unhindered, right? So, uh, 
<laughs> I mean, I think Anyways, there's my 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 uh, my spiel for now. <laughs> I think it's really important. Thank you, Dakota. I think it's really important to say uh, I'm a, a white settler. I'm a European settler, and most of us in the uh, Nest Funding Network are. But I think it's we could almost say that we in the community Nest Finding Network were able to find that see and find that hummingbird that we have to acknowledge that our the, the skills that were passed on to us were originally from an indigenous elder who had very uh, deep knowledge of birds and i know sarah is more familiar with that particular history than i am but i, I that is why we were able to see her um, we knew how to her it was because of that indigenous knowledge passed on to us. And then that kept the story, Light of the Hummingbird. That was also a gift from the Quechua indigenous that we would not have been able to leverage finding that Anna's hummingbird and then sharing that find, that indigenous, Quechua indigenous story to share with everybody. And, and she caught, that story caught everybody's imagination and gave everybody hope. So not only are the indigenous um, Sequetmuk and Slowitus and Squamish cold water band, indigenous um, leading the way in terms of protecting the lands and the waters here in this province and in particular against the Trans Mountain Pipeline but the hummingbird um, what she was able to do would probably not have been apparent to us humans if it wasn't for the, the work of indigenous elders that came before us. Thank you. And I like that um, that outlook as well as, as you and, and as Dakota, you were saying about um, the laws that uh, First Nations have as well being more responsibilities. I, that really sums up if, if we would all think sympathetically, compassionately and empathetically for what we can do to help our neighbors, if, if we live with that basis, it sounds like that's exactly what it encapsulates. If we have that attitude, we would hardly need laws because we would be looking out for each other's good and welfare, right? If we have that attitude, that's all we need for the absolute best societies we could ever design. Uh, so this is what I, I, I hope everybody will be able to take away. Um, is If we can apply that, wow, the world we can make? Oh, for, for hummingbirds and for each other? No kidding. <laughs> um, absolutely. And, 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 and I, I love seeing this kind of thing. And, and, and as you were saying, exactly, with indigenous people, studies have shown that they are the best at protecting natural lands, so much more so than, than like, you know, us as settlers uh, who have come to places and are, are especially with, with people who are... Um, who are there to extract resources, as you know, as as they say, and so on, or to to make a profit, and so on. Instead of thinking in terms of what can we benefit from from a place, if we think of how can I help to protect and and increase the welfare of this place and everybody who lives here, that will make all the difference. I think, and then we'll benefit from it as well because it all comes back to us. There are consequences that all of us reap from our actions. And what I've drawn here in the meantime, while we were having this discussion, is uh, the, the beginnings of these nests that Donna and Sarah were looking for. And there's many different, uh, or slight differences in the, in the form that hummingbird nests take. But to think of this in terms of the size, it would easily fit in the palm of your hand. It's tiny, tiny, um, not much bigger than a thimble. <laughs> and uh, what happens here is that they select a place to put it. 
And they do a they weave it together from a combination of spider webs. <laughs> so you know how how birds will sometimes pick a hair from your dog or from you know that's lying around and they use that to line their nests. Well, hummingbirds are small enough they actually use spider webs to stick some of it together. Yeah. And then they stick uh, pieces of lichens. And you remember what lichens are? Lichens are if you look at trees on the side of trees and on rocks as well, you'll find these interesting little flaky looking. Uh, growths of that look almost like plants and almost like fungi or mushrooms they're actually a combination of a, of a, a, a fungus which is like like mushrooms a, 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 a group of it's a larger group that way but it's the body of of, of what makes up um, mushrooms uh, that uh, is the main part of it that's what you you touch and you feel on a lichen those little floppy things that grow in the trees and then inside of them are uh, cells that live with them. Again, neighbors benefiting each other. These are algae or cyanobacteria, which are both types of organisms, that, single cells that use sunlight as energy and make uh, their uh, sugary food. And then they, some of that sugars leak out into the space around them, into the body of this fungus. And the two together survive better because they use together sunlight to generate sugars uh, and they sort of share that with each other in a sense. And then you have this organism that can live in a place that others can't. And so those lichens, um, the hummingbirds will take pieces of them and glue them to their nest. And they, you can see these beautiful little nests with all these little flaky lichens on the outside, like little leaves on it. And then you, you guys can tell me a little bit more about how you find these perhaps uh, as I continue to draw the egg and the chick and then the, the, the say the mother hummingbird uh, on the, the nest or above the nest. The, the nests are really, 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 really small. They're four centimeters in diameter, which is like <laughs> this big. And the first nest that we actually found was 40 feet or what is that? 20, 22 meters in the air. So it was like three stories up. Wow. And it, it was the only way we were able to find the nests was by using our hearing. So the, the mother, Anna's hummingbird, does a little um, sound when she's coming to her nest. And she just, it's like a little. Okay. <laughs> and she does it when she comes. Yeah. So if you're able to hear that, those sounds are very quiet. And um, turns out that um, the pipeline company had hired some older men to um, do their nesting bird nesting surveys, which, and unfortunately that is the hearing range that is often lost by older men, oh, um, nice. that in the higher range. So he wasn't able to hear it. And it, to be fair, it's hard to find a nest that's four centimeters in diameter. They do get a little, the nests get a little bit bigger because they expand as the babies, as the baby, the eggs hatch and the babies grow, the nest expands a bit with the spider webs, but yeah. So it was all hearing for us, how we found them. See, that's a familiar sound. That's the sound that uh, the one I, I, I nicknamed Tinker, Tinkerbell, <laughs> who, who uh, has uh, her territory, including our, our balcony here. She makes that sound when she comes to feed as well. It's this sort of, yeah, yes. that, that sound, that chip, that high pitched look sort of sound that she makes. And I can always tell she's around when she makes that. And I look at there, she's sitting on the, there she on is. the feeder. Yeah. It's a little, it's a, the feeding sound is a tiny bit different from what okay. she uses when she's going to the nest. Okay. Um, the nest one is a little bit less, uh, it's, it's more irregular. Um, and, and they use the same sound when they're agitated as well, but it'll be more. Um, yeah, that must be sort of what I'm hearing uh, partly. A little yeah, bit, it's like when, more intense. So yeah. I've heard her say, do that when there's another hummingbird that comes mm -hmm. to challenge. Uh, yes. to try to take a drink and then she'll make these these chattery sounds uh and then chase it off because they're really really territorial mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and you know that's something oh Sorry. go on was i was just going to say it's something right? about the territory that's interesting is that mm -hmm. they're in the area that we were protecting and that the hummingbirds were protecting there may have been one or two males with uh you know like 16 females so the, the males hold down quite a wide territory and they'll have a whole bunch of different females with nests within their territory. Interesting. So this, this was the Anna's hummingbird, right? That's right. So that's, that's neat that you bring that up because I was reading about the Rufus hummingbird and there's something fascinating about these guys. Um, the Rufus hummingbird is a little bit different in that way, in that 
uh, by the way, I've been starting to draw the chick here in the meantime, but the Rufus hummingbird is really neat because the males, they hold down a relatively small area, uh, but an area with a high density of flowers, lots of flowers, really, really high quality feeding. They do this because they make these spectacular displays uh, in the spring uh, to, to gain the attention of females and to drive off other males. And they need to have a lot of energy to do that. Uh, they also have shorter wings than the females because the shorter wings allow them to make these fast changes in direction more easily. But because they're shorter, they actually need to, to beat a little bit harder than, than longer wings, which is why they need more energy. So they have these highly aerial acrobatic movements, which means shorter wings, but shorter wings means more energy. So they need these high quality uh, areas with lots of flowers. Females of the Rufus hummingbird have a bit of a wider uh, range. They actually, the males drive them away from their territories. The females take uh, larger areas as territories with more sparse flowers, but that's okay because their wings are longer. They've evolved to be longer, which helps them to fly more long distances, more efficiently using less fuel. And because of that, they are able to survive in these larger areas. And so now we have what is called in, in biology, sexual dimorphism. That means that the males and the females look a little different from each other. And especially in this way with their wing length, it's different in rufous hummingbirds. And it has to do with the kinds of territories that each type holds. And because of the way that they end up having to fly for those. So I, I love the way that the, the biology uh, works out and how, how they behave and how they have to survive affects the way that they um, have evolved to look. Uh, so, and that's different with different species. As Sarah was saying with the uh, Anna's hummingbird, it's not that way. They are actually different from the Rufus hummingbird. So really need to see the differences in the different life forms all of our neighbors around us and how they, how they are, are so well suited to the, where they live and how they live. So we've got a chick in, in the nest here. And there's also an egg. Now the chicks and the eggs probably don't occur at the same time typically, but I've drawn one of each so you can sort of see their size. And the eggs are ridiculously tiny. What, they're like a raisin in size or something? They're not much bigger, is it close to that? I've heard people say it's like a jelly belly. <laughs> That's a good one. If you know what that is, yeah. <laughs> wow. They're really, really small. <laughs> so that's the, the chick. And then the, the, the hummingbirds feed their chicks by, just like other birds where they will eat, in this case, these guys eat um, mostly nectar, a lot of nectar for the, uh, for the, the fuel from the, the sugars and the nectar, but also they eat small insects like gnats that catch them in the air. Uh, they're really good at catching them, of course, because they're so fast flying. If you've ever seen these, so they'll catch the little insects, they'll swallow them, and then the mother will come back to the nest. Or does the father also feed or just the mother? I think it's just the mother in this case. I think it's just the mother. And then she will come and regurgitate, bring up some of that food. It's not fully digested, but it's been partly processed. And, and she'll feed that sort of mixture to her, her young, which will then, and then you've seen probably photos of other birds feeding their young. The chicks open their mouth wide and the mother goes and sticks her beak in and then they will just drink up some of that stuff. So she shares. Um, and, uh, so that's what happens at the nest there. Um, and they have, they have a really a much higher percentage of insects that they eat during this time of the year. Okay. Um, the Rufus anyway, Protein, whereas the right? Anna's will eat, um, insects all, almost all the year. They do supplement with, with nectar when it's available, but, um, but when they're, when they're, when they're laying eggs and feeding chicks, their, their insect, their protein count goes up by them eating more insects. That makes sense, right? Because nectar from flowers is a wonderful a source of sugars, but proteins are necessary because proteins are what make up a large part of the structure of our bodies. The hard parts, there are these the various kinds of, of hard materials that are built, not the bone necessarily, but like the muscles and so on. They have a very high protein content. And so babies, when they're developing in their eggs and so on, a lot of growth requires a lot of protein. And insects and the bodies of, of other animals have a lot of protein. So that's why it's so important for her to, uh, to catch insects 
and then regurgitate them and feed them to her young as well because they're growing actively so they need it a lot so that's really neat actually and i'm drawing now the the mother actually here which is sitting above the nest uh and when they're perched of course their little wings are are tucked in on their sides and you can't see them so uh they look a little different they, i think they're absolutely adorable birds no matter what they're doing uh this is very similar in the body shape to the one flying but this one is actually sitting on a branch here the other end of the branch there uh, and then i'm gonna just as we do this i'm gonna continue drawing her here um, the one neat thing about rufous hummingbirds uh, and this is true of this species especially now not all hummingbirds as sarah was saying not all hummingbirds migrate right so some birds migrate uh, some birds will will spend their summer in uh in in the northern hemisphere in further north and their winter further south where to follow the warmer temperatures as they change through the seasons right so they don't always stay in the same place now anna's hummingbirds they are year-round residents here in bc they stay all year long so that's why some of us have been feeding them in the winter uh when it got really really cold this winter and, and we had to maintain the 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 nectar in our feeders liquid because otherwise they freeze and the birds die uh so we had to do that in the winter for those of us who put feeders out once you start in the winter you got to keep doing it or because they rely on it if they've set up their territory they may die if you stop feeding them so if you're going to get into it make sure you stay consistent with it and those hummingbirds stay here rufous hummingbirds migrate they go south for the winter uh and what's really neat about the rufous hummingbird is that when you compare the total length of that journey of how far they fly to their winter grounds uh compared to their body length which is really really tiny they are the bird that fly that has the longest migration of any bird on earth when you compare that length of the journey to the length of their body so proportional to their body they make the longest distance flight which is kind of neat to know I'd like to add something about um, nest finding because it can be an exciting, um, it, something that people want to try. But I also, with um, the community nest finding network, um, oh, it's we don't actually go into wild spaces trying to find nests, especially not ground nesting birds, because we can disturb without intending to. We can even just if, like, if you walk straight up to a nest, for example, that pathway becomes one that predators may recognize as a pathway to something. So um, I don't I just want to I just don't want you to get the idea if you're watching this this program that it's OK to just go out and start looking for nests. Um, uh, we, we can do harm without intending to. So. Um, you know, feel free to reach out to the Community Nest Finding Network if you do want to learn more about that. We did some training programs that we have like Zoom recordings of that we'd be happy to share if you're wanting to learn more about how to do this in a good way. Um, and also, I wanted to extend the invitation. Uh, there, everywhere that I look around here in the city where I live in North Burnaby, but also in the outlying areas, but particularly in the urban areas, there are little pockets of wild forest and wild land that could really use some help from humans. I see places where the blackberries are growing over other trees. And if you felt so inspired, you could clip that blackberry or pull it down off the tree, trying to keep back some of the invasive plants that are taking over the wild spaces in our, in our urban areas. So I just wanted to extend that invitation. There are places that need our reciprocal care and attention as humans all around us and you never know if you walk down your alley or wherever you live you might see a place that you can help make it a little bit better by by tending to it it's a good point because um, blackberries are one of the types of plants that we humans have introduced here to places where they didn't naturally live and that's fine for some types of plants that don't spread like wild but blackberries do. They are really aggressive as plants go. They spread like wild. And the problem with that is that they take up space that other plants might be able to use. And plants need light. So if they grow over other plants, they shade them. 
and they outcompete the plants that might be important for hummingbirds. So salmonberry, um, as uh, Dakota was saying as well, is one of the important uh, um, uh, sources of food for rufous hummingbirds, and, and they're coming out about now. Uh, uh, wild raspberries, various other kinds as well are important for them. But these blackberries, as Sarah is saying, they overgrow things a lot very quickly. And so even though they taste good, we want to clip them back um, if we can, because they are taking over a large part of our, of our, of our native uh, plant species. And English ivy is another example of an invasive that's taken over a lot of our little microforest fragments in the urban centers. And those microforest fragments are really, really important for wild birds um, and for an other animals and plants. So yeah, I, at the same time, that said, you also have to know how to deal with invasive plants. There's, you know, you have to do that responsibly as well. So there's a lot to learn, but you know, there's, you should investigate if you're curious, figure out how to do it well. Yeah. And there's like, often there's like ivy poles that are organized by parks and whatnot to learn, to learn the proper technique and the right time of year to do that work. And this is important work that's referred to as restoration. Um, and restoration means to, to put something back the way it, it was, that it should be, it, it is healthier in this case. Uh, and there are many wonderful types of activities that you can engage in to help restore uh, these natural environments to what they should be before our uh, human impact caused them to change. And this is true for uh, streams, uh, where it's important for fish that are laying eggs, for example, to, healthy streams are important. We talked about that in previous episodes uh, with respect to how forestry has been, in some cases, negatively impacting some of the streams for salmon. Um, and as Sarah's saying, it's also very important for birds uh, with respect to the invasive, um, which means plant species that, that or, or that species that grow out of control, uh, those plant species here, like ivy, like um, uh, blackberry, that get in the way of other plants that these birds need to survive. So I'm just adding this uh, last bird here. As you've seen, I've been adding this guy is another flying one, just to show what they look like from another point of view, from the front showing their belly. So the one on the left was showing its back. And you can see that the way that the the feathers on the wings overlap. The fronts of the feathers, the leading edges are visible when you look at it overlapping, uh, when you look at it from above the wing. And when you look on the underside of the wing, it's the trailing or back edges of the feathers that overlap. Uh, the, and that's important because when you, they, they layer this way because when, when air comes from below, which is important because birds push the air down below, right? That air, if, if the feathers were lined up in the other way, that would spread the feathers out, that air pressure. And that would make spaces between the feathers and the bird would have a harder time flapping. But the way that they're layered here makes it such that when the air hits those wings or when the wings hit the air and push down, the air isn't able to separate the feathers. So it's a really neat bit of um, sort of like engineering, bioengineering sort of thing that keeps the bird's um, wings together when they're pushing down on the air. Just a little bit of a neat fact about them there. Um, so I'm just gonna finish up this guy here as we're getting close to our time limit. Um, but anyway, yeah, so I'm gonna keep finishing this. Uh, if, if, if any of you want to add other things that we should talk about before we um, finish the lesson, go for it. And I'll just keep on adding little bits of heat and stuff. Um, and in the meantime, um, we also have here an example of how the wings of this little, oops, I kind of went out of control. <laughs> My computer does that sometimes, let's fix it. The wings of this little guy, when they're beating fast, and we're seeing it from a different angle here, the wing shape changes here because these wings are flexible. And so, because the feathers will, will kind of be able to flex. And so, when it's making these figure eight shapes. Um, and it's this, imagine these wings are now coming forward. That's kind of why we're seeing a little bit of an edge on, and at the very end here, you see that it, the, the wing tip is slightly turned down. 
and it is moving forward to push the air down and then it'll turn back and then push the air down with the back side of the wing. So we're seeing a very different kind of motion here than in the one on the left. And here again, we see the feathers under the wing and we're seeing the back ends of the feathers overlapping. And then with the other wing here, we're seeing also this is kind of pushing forward and down. So that's why they're shaped differently than on the bird on the left. So these guys are amazing to see. If you ever see slow motion of them, uh, it's, it's fascinating to see how their wings change shape as they beat them. And to think how fast they move, roughly 50 times per second. That's incredible. Human eyes can only see things uh, and, and distinguish things flickering at about maybe up to 20 per second. After that, it blends together and our eyes can't tell the difference between things. So you can't see their wings moving each time. They're 50 times each second. It's, it's amazing how quickly they can beat their wings. And here we go. There's the gorget feather. The gorget is named after, there was a, like for example, in, in uh, knights and uh, ancient uh, uh, warriors, they had this throat protective bit of armor that fit over their throat and it, it, it kind of came down. And that was called a gorget. So hummingbirds have this little kind of armor-like patch of, of bright color feathers that they show off to others. So that's the, the function of those is to flash to other members of their species. And perhaps, uh, I'm not sure if they're used to frighten other animals, but uh, sometimes bright colors can be used for that. But I think it's mostly to show to their own uh, kinds. And they, they're iridescent, as I said, which means that they can change their color depending on the way that the light hits them. And so they, they look shiny and metallic. And so here we have another one that's facing us now. And we have all four of, all five of these hummingbirds and the egg now in place here. And uh, you can always come back to this afterwards and, and slow it down, replay it, uh, and, and show any part of the drawing to follow along if you want, if you didn't have a chance to follow on fully. But feel free to use these again to, if you wanted to send letters um, to your MLA or your MP or other people that may be important in making laws, uh, or, or otherwise caring for, or be in an important uh, position of decision for caring for some lands on which hummingbirds or other species live. Um, include your drawings with your letter, for example, maybe. Uh, maybe color them. I think that people have a greater tendency to read things or to pay attention to remember your message if they come with a really nice drawing, perhaps. I would encourage that. I think that it works really well. I've done that in the past, and I'm hoping that it maybe works. But oh, look at that. that excellent. There's Sarah's. Oh, and. Um, Maya, can you tell us as well, if others have drawn pictures and would like to submit them to Sierra Club, is there a place they can send them? Because I know that sometimes we've had a sort of a gallery of some of the pieces and I, I, I love to see people's uh, work. Uh, it looks so great when, when you see them come in afterwards and you see these drawings made. Yeah, absolutely. We'd love to see everyone's drawings. You can send those to social at sierraclub.bc.ca and I'll drop that into the chat. And then we're also gonna be sending um, an email with resources from the webinar today, uh, as well as the recording. So you can take the art lesson again, um, and that'll also include all those links. Excellent. Um, I'd like to add that um, this is, um, I, I'm assuming there's a lot of uh, children, though some, probably some adults as well, uh, doing, uh, engaging in this uh, artwork. And, uh, you know, like uh, kids don't have uh, the right to, to vote or engage in politics in many ways, but um, this is one of those ways. Um, there are many other ways for, for youth, um, uh, young kids to, to get involved. Many youth movements have happened and like you kids have a voice and it should be heard because people of my generation were supposed to bequeath the earth, leave it to uh, the next generations in a, in a better state than it and we entered it. So it's, uh, you have very much a voice and it should be heard and listened to. And I've seen, I've seen kids make waves brilliantly. That's a so, really great point, Dakota. Yeah. Um, we shouldn't let not being able to vote stop us. I so agree with you. And kids are the next generation of people who, as you said, are going to be left to, with, with, with the earth to take care of it. And so, yeah, that's why, I, for, for me, I, I find it so important to reach out to them in terms of books or, as you're saying, to other ways that we can get involved to 
to besides just voting. I, I really like that. It's a very good point that we should be making. And um, I love it when I see parents encouraging their kids to become involved in helping to protect the natural wonders out there, um, our neighbors, because if we can encourage those who are coming after us and who will be here long after we are, then we're we're doing what we can to make this a lasting attitude. It's one thing for us to feel like we want to be involved in protecting our neighbors in uh, of every species, but we also want to make sure that that message stays for future generations. And the way to do that is to pass that on to those who will be here after us. And those are our, uh, the kids around us and all the youth, everybody who is younger than us. And so, yeah, if we can do that, please let's do it as much as we can. And to, and to add to that, I'd like to say, even for those who, who can vote, uh, I would say I'd, I'd rather you vote on the front lines. <laughs> and uh, there are many Indigenous nations. I saw some people talking about uh, groups and people they were connected with, but there are many Indigenous, indigenous nations who are standing up for their territories um, all over in front of uh, TMX, um, different land rights, which will um, give them more autonomy over things like over logging and other things that affect the climate. You know, uh, the new chocolate have a have a a case going on right now, and you know then there's uh, the the get sand about Soden up north with the CGL, and um, even here, uh, you know, um, my tribe, for instance, Muptagila, we're re-establishing ourselves um, in the name of the government, right? So uh, now these are these are places where efforts and funds and stuff should be. Uh, a funnel to, I, I, in my opinion, my humble opinion. Um, but uh, hey, I'm. <laughs> yeah, fully agreed. Yeah, and and the thing is, when we do help out, it does make a difference. People often feel uh, despair, like what you know, what could, what what difference can I make with that? But it does it does actually help. It really does. So whatever you can, as uh, in any of these ways that Dakota was saying, I encourage everybody to help, especially those of us who can, not everybody can, but those who can, please let's, let's get involved and, and make a difference to protect our lands, to uh, help First Nations protect our lands, their lands, everybody's lands, every species lands. We have to work together. And if we can, let's do what we can. Um, I, as a settler, I'm very much in support of this and everybody should be out there. Um, I am grateful to be able to live But so there, there we go. That's the drawings, and I think that uh, I, I'm thinking we're at the end of the uh, of the webinar now. But um, so I personally very much thank everybody for joining us. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be involved in these uh, bits of outreach. I, I'm just so happy that that there are people that are interested in in doing this. Uh, I hope you had a lot of fun. Um, I hope that you can uh, take some of these uh, messages and apply them to your life as much as you can and encourage your friends to join in as well. We'll have these, these kinds of webinars coming up in the future as well. Uh, keep an eye out on Sierra Club BC's uh, uh, pages and their webpage. They show that on their education tab for when new ones are coming up. And we'll, you know, we'll keep having fun with these kinds of drawings as long as we can. And with that, I'll hand it to... Uh, Dakota and Maya and Sarah and Donna. Yes, uh, again, um, always a pleasure um, chatting with you, Julius. And uh, it's amazing to have so many uh, different voices come forward uh, with their expertise in these in these areas, especially with the, the animal kingdom. And so, I'd like to thank everybody for coming and Gilakasla, uh, Gilakaslaki. Yeah. Thank you all for hosting and holding this space and welcoming so many folks to learn and, and be active with drawing and learning about our, the world. Thank you and how to take action. <laughs>